So <clears throat> I'm going to walk through how the role of open source has evolved at Morgan Stanley. And we're breaking down the four periods. The 80s, not a decade I was in love with. Uh, the 90s, split into the first and second half, where the inflection point is, is the release of Pearl 5. And then the 21st century and beyond, because that seems like a nice place to break it down. Now, in the old days, pretty much all of our computing um, was done on IBM mainframes, um, where we did all of our back office accounting. You make a trade, we got four or five days to settle it, get cash into all the various parties' hands and, and, and accounts and so on. And most of that stuff was done by batch programs in the IBM mainframe. Now, in the front office, where the traders are actually trying to make all this cash, there was a requirement for a much more fat, rapid development environment. And so we hired all these finance professors, the moral equivalent of rocket scientists in our industry, to come in and you know, do development for some cutting edge tools that would give us a big competitive advantage over, over uh, the other you know, Wall Street firms. And those people brought with them Unix, because they were coming from the academic world. Um, once Unix is in the door, well, you gotta hire Unix systems administrators, well, you should hire Unix systems administrators. If you don't, you regret it. And the system then brought with them from that same culture an awful lot of open source software because the state of the art at that time, if you wanted to build a Unix um, environment, was you use an awful lot of open source. So that got its foot in the door. Now, it's important to note that the corporate decision was to bring in the rocket scientists, who in turn brought in Unix, who in turn brought the system in, who in turn brought open source. The corporate world in the beginning did not say, let's go get all this free software and use it to make money. That's not how things worked. Now, if you're going to be developing most of the software on your own, you know, support's not an issue. It's going to be your software. And if you pick up a, pre a free solution to one of your problems and use that for your own development, then you're supporting it anyway. So the support issue was really a moot point at that, at that stage. Now, in the early 90s, things changed. That's when we saw a massive explosion in the deployment of Unix. It went from a, a couple of hundred to several thousand machines by the middle of the 90s. And this is where open source software really started to have a much higher profile. And the Highest profile, a single component, if I had to pick one thing, was definitely the Perl programming language, beyond a doubt. A lot of the development teams began using Perl for serious production applications. That was a big change. Um, especially, probably the key thing there would have been uh, the SIB Perl extensions for Sybase. We were and still are largely a Sybase shop. And these guys thought it so cool that they could you know, write quick and dirty Perl scripts that would you know, do some of the data munching they had to do um, in Sybase. They could access Sybase from Perl. Hey, that's cool. Um, a lot faster to do that than doing it in C. The same was true for Tickle TK, which, sad to say, is really not a, um, has kind of died off, use has died off, but in the early 90s, that was the easiest way to get any kind of GUI app deployed. And if you've ever written in C in X11, you're not going to argue this point. Um, that's really serious pain. That's for the masochist in you. So now we have high profile production apps that are being deployed <clears throat> that were written with these languages. And of course, the inevitable debate about support arose. The good news is that while the debate raged on, and the debate never really ended, well, we just kept on deploying more open source solutions, um, and that didn't really change. What we found in practice was that the open source community support model worked pretty well, um, certainly for Perl, and I think it's a credit to the community, despite some of our <clears throat> less than optimal periods of communication. The, that model did work very well. When we had a problem, um, we'd post in the appropriate news groups or mailing list, and we'd often get a solution for it. I um, mean, whether it was a stupid bit of coding on our part or a bug in the actual, you know, the core Perl interpreter. Now, the reason these products succeeded internally was they each typically had uh, a champion by a group of fanatics, excuse me, I mean owners, who looked after the code, and they were the, sort of the internal caretakers, and they were the interface with these open source communities. In the case of Perl, that was me. Um, and I'd say by and large that we were able to solve problems with the open source community model a lot quicker in general. And I have to be general here, I can't dig too much of the details, but generally speaking, that model worked better for us than a lot of the commercial support models did. Commercial support can be a headache. Uh, and that really depends, though, on the firm. Uh, it's not fair to categorically say, and, and I love to respect Mr. Baker, I think you categorized the open source a little bit unfairly by saying that the support model didn't work well. There are a lot of open source communities that are hands down beating the pants off of a lot of commercial vendors when it comes to support quality. And if I name the ones that are bad, I'll probably get fired, so I'll shut up. Um, <laughs> No, please, I don't want to be fired. I can't say names. Uh, so the usage growed. Um, <clears throat> it continued to grow. Um, it didn't slow down at all. Now, the inflection point that divides the early and the late 90s was, had to be the release of Pearl 5. A couple things happened here. One, we started to see the emergence of a lot of commercial companies that were providing the traditional commercial support for open source products. 
The fact remains that even though we were able to deal with the fact that no, there was no 800 number to call when you know you had a pearl cord up on, on your hands, um, we didn't care. A lot of companies, they really like that 800 number. That's a really good warm and fuzzy feeling. Even though it's totally useless, and even though the people you call up probably can't even spell the name of the product that you want to get support for, that didn't matter. You can say to your manager, it's a supported product. See, here's a phone number. Oh, great, install it. That's good enough for some people. Um, but in terms of our use of open source, uh, Perl 5, and really more importantly, CPAN, and the explosion of all the extension modules that expanded that range of problems which Perl became applicable. You know, in the Perl 4 days, you had SIBPerl, you had OroPerl, you had DNS Perl, you had FUBAR Perl, you had all these different Perl binaries. Extending Perl was, to say the least, not pleasant. Well, if you had the code access, you might argue it was still true in Perl 5, but the reality was that it did get extended. Now we suddenly had interfaces for a lot of the other infrastructure, and we could use it to solve a much broader range of problems. And that's where its usage really exploded. By the end of the decade, we had Perl officially listed along with C++ and Java as the primary development languages for distributed software development. And it really had become a peer along with those two.